Welcome to the madhouse. <laughs> Universal Studio Hollywood Halloween Horror Nights is a Southern California tradition that draws fans to Los Angeles from all corners of the globe simply because they want to be scared to death. This year, fans will face classic Universal monsters, celebrate holidays in hell, take another trip to the Upside Down, and witness the Ghostbusters battle sinister spirits. What else does Universal have in store for this year's Halloween Horror Nights in Hollywood? Are you ready to find out? Please welcome to the stage, Universal Studios Hollywood Halloween Horror Nights Creative Director, John Murdy. How you doing? All right, um, I have some good news and I have some bad news, okay? Which do you want first? Bad news, okay. Uh, my partner in crime, Chris Williams, is unable to be with us today because he is sick. He texted me on the way over and he's like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. So uh, on behalf of Chris, he wanted me to say he's very sorry he couldn't be with all you guys today. Um, do you want the good news? Yeah. yeah! Roll the video. Hey, Midsummer Scream, it's Greg Nicotero here. Very, very sad that I can't be there with you and John Murdy, but we have some very exciting news. Creep Show is coming. <laughs> Shutter streaming series produced by myself, made with lots of love and blood. I don't even think that makes sense, but it makes sense. Uh, anyway, The Maze is coming to Halloween Horror Nights at Universal. You're going to love it. It's going to have elements of the original movie plus the new series. I can't wait for you guys to see it. to Halloween Horror Nights 2019 in Universal Studios Hollywood. Give it up. How many of you guys are fans of the original film? The 1982 film? Right on. Uh, as a coincidence, so am I. <laughs> Um, I saw the film in the theater and I instantly fell in love with it. You know, Creepshow has been one of those properties that's kind of always been on my wish list that maybe one day uh, we would do it. And then, as it turned out, last year during Halloween Horror Nights, um, Greg came, Greg Nicotero came to the event and told us that there was going to be a new Creepshow series on Shudder. Do you guys know about this? Yeah. They just debuted the trailer at Comic-Con. Um, so the maze that we're creating for Halloween Horror Nights 2019 at Universal Studios Hollywood is uh, a combination of the original film directed by George Romero, the great George Woo! Romero, and the upcoming series that's going to be on Shudder that's debuting right around the time our event opens. Um, so you're going to get the best of both worlds. Is that okay with you? So what I'm going to do today, uh, Boils and Ghouls, is I'm going to uh, show you a little bit about what we're going to be doing with Creepshow. Um, and then um, I brought some other goodies to share with you as well. Maybe share some uh, Scare Zone characters, some Scare Zone art, some of the things we're creating for Halloween Horror Nights 2019. Is that okay with you? And I should, you know, in, in the spirit of full disclosure, I designed this obviously for myself and Chris to talk. So there'll be times when I click to a slide, which I... You know, honestly, I have no idea what I'm talking about. So just nod and smile when we get to those parts, okay? Yeah! 
All right, now obviously this all started with Greg Nicotero. Uh, Greg came to the event last year and brought everybody down from both the original Creep Show and also the new Shutter series. And actually that's when we started talking. That's very, very common for us. We're usually planning the event. Actually right now we're actually planning 2020 at the same time we're planning 2019. Um, but, but it's very often that we meet with people during the event and we start talking about the properties that we want to do the following year. So we started talking really early about Creep Show. Obviously, you know, we have a long history with Mr. Nicotero. Um, this is a picture of Greg and I inside a real uh, helicopter uh, that we created for one of our Walking Dead mazes. But I actually, I ran into Greg a lot you know, longer than Walking Dead. Um, years ago, I, I produced uh, a show for Universal Studios Hollywood, the old special effects stages show. It used to have a set called The Creature Factory. And I did a whole piece, a makeup piece, on Greg Nicotero and his work in a movie called Day of the Dead. And that's actually when I first met Greg, so I've known him for a long, 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 long time. What's great with working with someone like Greg and the talented people at K&B Effects is um, they know our product, they're big fans of Horror Nights. Um, so we actually designed this maze, you know, kind of hand in hand with Greg, sitting down in our office with Chris and I. Um, and also what's really exciting is because he did all the makeup and K&B did all the makeup for the new show That means we get to utilize the same molds that Greg created for the TV series So when you get to see the creatures um, for the new series, you're going to be seeing the exact same stuff that you saw on the television show so Let's talk about creep show so when you think about a movie like this and how you want to approach it you know the origin of this whole movie is that it's inspired by the old uh, EC comics, the horror comics of the 1950s that Romero grew up with. Um, we really wanted to pay homage to that, because if you guys watch Creepshow, it's got a lot of references to comic books, right? So the facade for our attraction is actually going to be a giant Creepshow comic book, and you're going to walk into the comic book, and the comic book's going to come to life. I'll show you um, a couple of examples of that. So, now, the host for our experience, kind of the through line that's going to take us through these five different stories that we're dealing with, is of course the creep. Uh, this is the new creep. This is the creep that Mr. Nicotero designed for the new series. Um, so, the first section of the maze is going to be called Meet the Creep, and we're going to be kind of walking through the pages of a comic book. I'll show you just a, a rough design element. Um, this is like the comic book art that you saw in the film, and our idea is that we wanted to bring that to life. So. Working with our designers, we were able to reach out to everybody at Shudder and not only get all of the comic book art being generated for the new TV series, but the thing I always loved about those old comic books were the kooky ads. You would find them, you know what I'm talking about? The authentic monkey's paw. Only $4.98. Um, so when you're walking through it, not only are you going to see comic book panels that are going to be setting up the five different stories that you're going to experience, but it's also going to be some of this, you know, these ads that you would historically find in these comic books. So this is just a rough SketchUp model that um, our design staff and our art department are working on. So as you're going through this first section, you're kind of walking through the pages of the Creep Show comic book, and the creep is coming to life and attacking you. And you're going to see the creep throughout this experience. As I mentioned, he's more or less the through line. But then we get to our first story. You know, so Chris and I had the, you know an enviable task of picking three stories from Creepshow, the 1982 film. So right out of the gate, you know, the way Chris and I work is we have to both, you know, agree 100% or it doesn't go in the maze, and that's how we've always worked. Um, we didn't have any arguments about what to start the Creepshow maze off with. We wanted to start it off with Father's Day. Now, how many of you guys have seen the original film, the 1982 film? Okay. And how many of you guys are going to now go out and rent or, you know, get it on... Yep, and watch it. It's, a, it's a, one of my favorite horror movies. If you like anthology horror movies, it's fantastic. But the story, the first story is called Father's Day, and it's about um, this uh, patriarch of this very wealthy man, you know, who's kind of a tyrant, and his, uh, his daughter murders him with an ashtray. Um, and then on Father's Day every year, she goes to the family, you know, plot. He's buried right there on the property, and she goes to pay her respects to the father she killed. But on this particular Father's Day, old Nathan Grantham comes out of the ground, and he says, It's Father's Day. I want my cake. And that's, you know, what we're going to bring to life. So. What we have to bring to life is the Grantham house and the family plot. So after you get the comic book panel that sets you up for Father's Day, this is what you're walking into. So uh, 
gave this to Chris. I pull all the reference from the movie, and then Chris and his art department starts drawing it. So this is just an elevation. This is a, from Chris's drawing package. This is the Grantham house. And, you know, Chris and our art department, what they want to do, and what we always at least strive to do with every maze we do for Halloween Horror Nights, is to try to nail every detail. So, you know, that includes Nathan Grantham's grave, and we wanted that exact gravestone. We wanted to build it exactly like the movie. We wanted to see Nathan coming out of the grave. So this is just another elevation that shows you, you know, what Chris and his team are designing and what is being built right now. And then you go into the Grantham's house, and really, you know, one of the things that was really important to us, and it was important to Greg, and we talked a lot with Greg about how to bring this to life in a maze, is not only is the movie inspired by a comic book, but it looks like a comic book. You know, all of the individual segments start off as a comic book panel illustration, and then they bleed into the live action. Um, but also, whenever something really bad happens in Creepshow, the lighting changes, and it goes red and blue, and it has those crazy kind of lightning bolt patterns. And this is something we wanted to bring to the maze. So as you're going through the Grantham house and you're being attacked by Nathan um, in his, you know, just crawled out of the grave state, um, every time he attacks, we're doing this lighting trick so that we're paying homage to the film. Uh, even to the extent of, of doing the, the lightning bolt pattern. So here's a, another elevation I'll show you. This is, of course, the I got my cake scene from Father's Day. But when he comes out through that, you know, serving door, the whole background that lights up behind him turns into that kind of red and blue lightning bolt pattern that you see in the film. So all throughout the maze, uh, the direction we're giving our lighting designers and our lighting team is to bring it to life so that it feels like a comic book. And that's Father's Day. Story number two, or episode number two, uh, The Crate. You guys remember The Crate? Okay, this is uh, Adrian Barbeau, Fritz Weaver, Hal Holbrook were the stars of this particular episode of the movie. And what it, it's about, a small college on the East Coast where a janitor just so happens to find this really old shipping crate from 1834 that's shoved under a staircase. It's probably been down there for, you know, over a hundred years. And he calls a professor and tells him, you know, to come down here. They may have made a major discovery. But when they open up the crate, um, there's something really, really bad inside it. Do you guys know the name of the, the actual, what's the official name? This should have been my trivia question. I should could use this later. Fluffy, that's right. Fluffy the Crate Beast is the name of the creature. He's like an ape-like creature that's inside the crate, and of course he starts eating people, and that's where the horror ensues. Um, so the main setting for us to recreate here is the science classroom. Um, and of course, as you can see from the screen grabs I've got on the screen, there's an awful lot of blood. And I thought it might be kind of interesting, and this was something I was going to have Chris talk about, because he knows the chemistry behind this. Um, but, you know, how, how we make blood, you know, because you, you think it's like, you know, a no-brainer. Yeah, we do a horror event, there's a lot of blood. But when you're doing, did you guys see our Shining Maze a couple of years ago? Yeah. Remember the, like, the elevator scene, all that blood? That's like actually like a special kind of blood that our guys invented. Um, when, they, when they put it on, it looks like hot pink, and it looks horrible. So w the first time I ever saw them do this, I walked into The Shining, and I was like, my God, what have you done? It's pink, you know? Um, but uh, when it dries, it turns like the, red, and it looks wet, and it always retains that look. So these are just, um, this is just blood tests. This is what we do in our copious spare time. Um, so our prop team, uh, which is headed up by a gentleman named Tony Lindis and a whole bunch of talented uh, prop uh, and set dressing artisans, uh, they have to make a whole ton of this stuff. So they prefabricate the blood. That's why you see that blue um, tape on the side. They put it down so they can lift it off again and then they can take it into the environment and then, you know, facet it into the scenes and attach it. But the great part of it is it always looks wet and it stands up to heavy traffic, which we have in a maze. There's a lot of you that walk through our mazes. Um, this is just another example of Chris's drawing package. So Chris hand draws everything, you know, even today. It, it, this always blows people's minds when I tell them that. We hand draw everything. So, you know, if you're aspiring, you know, to, to do this for a career, how many of you guys out there like want to be in this industry or do something like this for a living? A lot of you, yeah. Um, learn how to draw. <laughs> I know we, we, we always default to the computer these days and think that everything's designed in the computer. And of course we use the computer. It's a major tool in our design kit. But all of our set designers and illustrators, they all hand draw every single elevation. And this is just an elevation that shows the scene when you come in and meet Fluffy. Now, of course we have to create Fluffy. Um, 
but he's really small. If you've ever seen the movie, he's like, you know, his feet would be like where my knees are, and this would be his body. Um, so that presented an interesting challenge for us. So Chris and our team devised a kind of clever way to do Fluffy. Um, he's, you know, inside his crate. Part of his body is fake, part of it is a creature costume, and it's integrated with the live performer. And we're building that right now. As a matter of fact, uh, this is his feet, <laughs> and that's his hand. Every day my phone blows up with like endless, endless texts from my makeup uh, team, which is a guy named Pat McGee, Pat McGee Effects. Um, and he's, you know, busily working with all of these molds and sculpting, and he's just constantly sending me all of these updates. But they're huge files, and they constantly block my phone. <laughs> uh, now, one of the people that Fluffy attacks is a guy named Charlie Garrison. And he's a, a student at the college, graduate student, and Fritz Weaver tells him, Charlie, don't go in there! But of course, like every horror movie, what do you do when somebody says, don't go in there? Go in there. You go in there. Charlie goes in, he can't resist because, you know, this might make his academic career. Unfortunately, he wakes up Fluffy and Fluffy, you know, smacks him in the face with his claw and does this horrible gash across his face. So that's a different kind of makeup that we have to create. You know, we create a lot of masks, but we also do a lot of what's called prosthetic makeup. And that's usually like a foam latex uh, appliance, sometimes it's silicone, that gets glued to the actor's face every single night and then the makeup gets blended and applied with the blood. So this is the prosthetic makeup that will be applied to the performers playing Charlie Garrison. Episode three. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about you guys, but when I saw Creepshow back in 1982, and I was... Mm, 15? 15? Um, so that means I probably snuck in. Um, <laughs> This is the episode that really freaked me out the most. Cockroaches. I can't stand cockroaches. Um, do you guys like cockroaches? No. Like First time I ever met my wife, she was holding a cockroach in her hand. She's like, look, and I'm like, oh, you're cool, let's get married. Um, <laughs> um, this is about a story about uh, a billionaire who lives in what's supposedly a germ-free apartment, a penthouse apartment in New York City and he's paranoid about germs, so he's kind of modeled after um, Howard Hughes. Um, but he keeps noticing that these cockroaches keep getting into his apartment, and he's getting more and more angry as he goes along, trying to understand how his germ-free apartment could have these bugs in it. And unfortunately, there's a blackout in New York City, and then all of the cockroaches start piling in through his vents and through the sink and through every single nook and cranny of his apartment until he is completely consumed with cockroaches. And the la you remember the last shot? I'll save it, I got a picture of it. Um, this is actually probably one of the harder design challenges for Chris and his team. Um, it's, it's actually easy to do jacked up scenes, you know, like haunted houses that are aged and, and look like they're falling down. That's actually easier to do scenically than to make something that looks super, super clean. This set always reminds me of Kubrick's like 2001 A Space Oddity. Um, so that's what Chris has to, you know, reproduce. And then my props guys have to go out and find like a vintage jukebox that looks exactly like the one in the film. Um, this is the elevation that goes along with that. So of course our guys draw all this stuff. Some of it gets built by our scenic companies. Some of it gets built by our prop artisans. Um, I just focused on one thing. When the blackout happens, there's, a, there's like an oxygen sensor siren that goes um, and I was, you know, going through the film like I do whenever I'm working on a maze, and I'm like, what is that thing? I don't know. It's kind of cool. I'm going to put it in the treatment, see if Chris builds it or not. Um, and so I was happy when I saw his drawing package, and I was like, geez, he actually, like, he did, he did a whole page just on this oxygen sensor. So, um, just like trying to get all the details of the movie, you know, try to nail all the things that we think are important in every scene, and then try to bring them to life for you guys, so that when you're walking through our maze, hopefully, if we've done our job right, you feel like you're walking through the movie. Um, and of course this happens. So, you know, this is quite a challenging scene to do, you know. Uh, I, I know our prop guys have got like kajillions and billions of bugs that they're working on. But, you know, you want the movement too. And it's just not acceptable to release a bunch of cockroaches loose in a maze. And, you know, it's, you know, it's frowned upon. So we couldn't do that. 
Um, so of course what we're going to do is uh, we're going to rely on projection as well as all of the static things that are in the scene. Um, so you're going to go through Upson's uh, penthouse apartment, you're going to see that all the bugs are starting to get in, and then you're going to go into his private sleeping chambers, and in the film he gets overwhelmed with cockroaches and then it kind of cuts to the next, presumably like the next day. Um, and, you know, the maintenance guy is finally calling to tell him, hey, you know, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here to help you with your bug problem. He's not answering the phone. And then you see, like, one cockroach run out of his mouth, and then hundreds of them pour out of it. Um, so we're going to do this scene, of course, because how could we not? Um, so that's a live performer. So we've got a live performer integrated with a special effect illusion table. Um, this is kind of like how we did the reverse bear trap for Saw. If you saw our saw maze, or one of our saw mazes over the years, the body is concealed within the set, and we're marrying up th their real body, which is usually their head, shoulders, and arms, to a, a fake body. Um, and then we're adding layers of projection on top of it, so that, you know, when you come through this last scene, um, you know, there's bugs crawling everywhere. And then after that, we're going to mess with you. And I'm just going to leave it at that. I don't really want to tell you. <laughs> I'll save some things. Um, now, the last two stories in Creepshow are based on the new Shudder series, and I'm not going to show any spoilers because I want you guys all to experience the series and see it just like I saw it. Um, so I'm just going to show you uh, a couple of references of like the drawing packages and things like that, but I'm going to save all the creatures because Greg would kill me. Because <laughs> he's created all of them and he wants, you know, he wants to have that impression, obviously, when you watch it for the first time. But there's two particular stories we're focusing on, both of which are from the upcoming series on Shudder. Um, one of them is called Grey Matter. Is anybody familiar with that story? It was a short story previously. Um, it's about a guy who uh, is, drinks a beer and ingests some mutagen that causes things to change. And that's all I'll say about that. Um, but his apartment, what we work with is we work with location photography. So we get all these pictures from the set and then we have to bring it to life. So uh, there's something in the apartment, but I won't tell you what that is. Um, and then Chris takes all of those pictures that I send him and he starts doing his drawings. So all of that moss and mold and mildew, all of that is stuff that you know Chris draws into the drawing package as you see here. And then that really is the job of our props and dressing people to come in and dress the set after the scenic crew is done um, to make it look exactly like it looks in the television show. Um, we're going to take you into the kitchen, and it's getting even worse, and it's even more mildewy, and there's this weird mold growing everywhere. And then this is just a close-up of one particular drawing of the kitchen. Um, so that's another example of what our props and dressing crew have to do. Uh, and then you're going to go into the bathroom, and it just progressively, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So if you're a germaphobe, or you don't like mold, or you're pretty much screwed. Sorry. <laughs> and. Again, this is a couple close-ups of uh, what Chris has drawn in the drawing package with our production designers. So it just gets worse and worse and worse, and then eventually you're going to meet what is behind all of this. And I'll leave it at that. And last but not least, episode five is a story called Bad Wolf Down. It's a story that takes place in France. Uh, it's kind of towards the, like, around the time of Battle of the Bulge, so towards the latter part of World War II. There's a, an American troop that's kind of caught behind enemy lines during that battle, um, and they have to retreat to a French um, jail cell, um, and that's where all the action takes place. So for us, we have to create this French jail cell, and immediately they start picking up on some things that are not right inside this jail cell. They see these claw marks on the wall like you see here. Um, the table's broken, there's dead body in there, there's, you know, uh, again, more of these jagged claw marks, and you start wondering, well, what's going on inside this? And of course, I give this to Chris and his team, and they draw it all up, so this is another example. Now, every one of these drawing packages is probably like 100 pages, you know, 100 pages of drawings. Um, we're doing more mazes than ever before this year. In total, we're doing, I don't know if you guys know this or not, uh, but we're doing 10 mazes this year, you know, so... Ten mazes times a hundred drawings per maze, you know, that's a lot of people drawing. And where do these people come from? Well, a lot of them are production designers for movies and television shows who then come over and they kind of moonlight for us in between productions. So we've got this staple of movie production designers that always like to come back and work with us on horror nights. And every once in a while, it's, it's cool. Like last year, we actually had a guy that we had drawing our maze and he goes, oh, I this was my movie, I worked on this movie. So we actually production designed the movie and production designed the maze. Um, 
And eventually, where we're headed is these jail cells, these very, very dark jail cells. And you know something bad is inside there waiting for you, you just don't know what it is. Um, but you see blood everywhere, and you see a full moon. Yeah. And then you walk inside the jail cells, and then it just goes bad. <laughs> and then once you've gotten through um, Bad Wolf Down, we're going to treat the, uh, the maze just like the movie, just like the original film. It starts with the prologue, and it ends with the epilogue. So, you know, if you remember the prologue to Creepshow, it's the, the dad is yelling at his son, how could you read this crap, you know? Why do you waste your time on these comic books? And he threatens to throw the comic book away. So when you come out of the last scene of Bad Wolf Down, you enter that alleyway, you see that the kid's comic book, his precious Creepshow comic book, has been thrown in the trash. And uh, you hear that creep laughter that you hear, you know, in the movie. And you know the creep is somewhere. So there's, you know, one last good jolt before you exit. And that's Creepshow! Show and tell. Um, so this is the new creep that Greg designed, and this is our sculpt in progress of the creep we're creating for the maze. Um, I brought some other goodies along to share with you guys. Is that okay? I could just leave. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, one thing, I, you know, I've done Midsummer Scream a whole bunch of times as, as, as long as there's been a convention. Um, Chris and I have spoken at a lot of conventions. We always try to do something new or different or share an aspect of the event that we haven't shared previously. And um, there's a maze we're working on this year. It's called Holidays in Hell. And, um, and what that maze actually really speaks to is, is graphic artists and, and graphic design and, and artwork because the, uh, the inspiration for this maze actually was vintage postcards. That's where this all started. Um, so what I thought I'd do is I'd, I'd showcase the work of, of um, one of our artists in particular. He's a guy named Lucas Colshaw. Uh, he's a fabulous artist. He's been with us for as long as I can remember. He designs every single character. Whenever you see our character renderings that get released for like the scare zones, that's Lucas. He does all of that. But Lucas is, a, is beyond just being able to be a great you know, costume designer, um, character designer. He's just a great artist in general. So this is the year we really let Lucas go wild, particularly with Holidays in Hell. Um, if you guys remember, I think this is one of the first mazes we announced. Um, you're all familiar with Holidays in Hell. It was a scare zone last year. You guys saw that? Um, it was, you know, such a well-received scare zone that we decided to turn it into a maze. Um, so, you know, it's basically Holidays Gone Bad. Uh, and it's uh, a maze we're doing with the um, uh, EMD artist Figure. I don't know if you guys, you guys know Figure's music? He's been a big part of Horror Nights for years and years, so I called up Figure and said, this would be cool if we worked together this year and we designed a, you know, a maze that featured your music as well. And um, like I said, it was inspired by postcards. I don't know about you guys, but I... Vintage postcards, particularly like Victorian era greeting cards and postcards freak me out. They're just creepy. I mean, well, I mean, Jesus, look at it. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Look at Santa. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, boys and girls. <laughs> um, the, the kid holding the turkey. <laughs> just, you know, these, I don't know what kids, you know, what their psychological state was in Victorian times, but it couldn't have been good. Um, so I, I, I started designing this maze just by pulling tons and tons and tons of vintage postcards and using that as inspiration. Um, and then for the facade of the maze, we knew we were going to be starting with New Year's Eve. And um, I wanted to design the facade like a big, giant postcard. And um, I pulled this, this is actually an old vintage Victorian era kind of postcard. And I thought this was really cool, but I gave it to Lucas and Chris and they turned it into this. So this is actually the facade. Um, where you see the, the big circle, that's, that's a video element. We're doing the clock as a, as a video element that changes. So you're, this is old Lang Syne, um, you know, as remixed by figure. And uh, you're seeing the clock do the countdown, 10, 9, 8. And when it gets to midnight, everything goes evil and the clock changes. 
um, and there was a lot of different characters. And, and for all of these, we tried to kind of set it in a specific time period. So for like this particular one, I just I just picked the year 1929. Because um, that's like when everything started to go to hell, <laughs> you know, basically the stock market crash It was kind of like the giddy heights of the golden, you know, the gilded age of the roaring 20s And then we go into the Great Depression. So all of all of the uh, characters that are out in front of this facade are kind of like um, Dressed like 1920s people that would be going to a New Year's Eve ball But they're all of course skeletons and corpses and of course we have father time out here as well um, you know, our, I mentioned our props and dressing team. Um, we, we have this off-site facility where we build all this stuff while, while we're waiting to get into the mazes. Um, I, I just think it's funny. I'm just going to read this because I, I took this picture and then I went, heads, teeth, digits, guts. <laughs> they have shelves organized by heads, teeth, severed fingers, guts. <laughs> Um, so these are static figures that are in a, in a tableau when you first come into the maze. Um, but where we're going to take you... Oh, it's Chris. See, he did make it after all. <laughs> uh, it's a, we decided to set New Year's Eve in a haunted nursery. Uh, whenever I do research for nurseries, and I've done a few creepy nurseries over the years, um, I always end up back at Chernobyl. <laughs> it's like every time I'm doing visual research, uh, there, there's a particular nursery in Chernobyl that's been there for, you know, since the accident in the 80s and it's slowly just rotted away and all the dolls are still there and all the stuffed animals. Have you guys seen this? It's the creepiest damn thing in the world. So I use that as our inspiration, but I knew that I also wanted, like, murals painted on the wall, like children's literature murals. And again, I, I went back to my research. Um, these are just some of the images I pulled that are, you know, existing children's literature images that were designed to really screw children up, obviously, right? I'm going to show these to my kids. Um, I mean, Mother Goose, look at her. Is that supposed to be soothing to a child in any way, shape, or form? Look at that hellacious thing riding that evil giant goose. And then, you know, the blackbird in the tree that's as big as the child, you know, just staring at him like, I want to eat you. <laughs> So, I gave these images to Lucas, and I'll, uh, I'll share with you some of the things he came up with for our, the murals you're going to see as you're going through this haunted nursery. So, uh, this is obviously a riff on Hansel and Gretel. This is all original artwork, you know, hand-drawn by Lucas. It's amazing. Um, I particularly like, I like this one. You know, there, there you can see he's riffing, but, it, but if... What's clever about his, he's got all these hidden jokes I've noticed in his illustrations and some of them took me a little bit of time. I'm like, look, there's Jack on fire <laughs> and there's Jill with her pail, you know. Um, and obviously, you know, he took the mother goose idea and, and ran with it. I love these. <laughs> these should be like t-shirts or, you know, a calendar or something. Um, obviously, Little Miss Muffet and the uh, cow jumping over the moon. But I, again, I love the way Lucas thinks and, and the way, you know, I, these aren't things I, I didn't write in the treatment. And the cow must have all of the cuts of meat labeled on him, you know. This is just stuff Lucas comes up with. Um, but it's absolutely gorgeous stuff. So this maze features a lot of really cool artwork. Easter, for example, you know, the... Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's one badass Easter bunny. Um... I hated Easter as a child. I just hated it. I, I, um, I did a haunted house once on Good Friday in my parents' house. And just my, my, my mom's a Catholic theologian, author of nine books. And she was just, she just, you know, we're getting ready to go to church and she's like, you're, you're what? I'm like, well, yeah, I'm, do, I'm doing a haunted house. It's like, it's Good Friday. And I'm like, well, you yeah, know, seemed like a good idea. Um, luckily it wasn't Easter themed. Uh, but I, I grew up in the 70s as a kid, you know, and I remember, um, I grew up uh, in Hacienda Heights in Whittier, in that area. Um, yay! You know the Pointy Hills Mall, you know, where they filmed Back to the Future? Yeah. That was like, I worked in that toy store when they were filming Back to the Future, so that was the first set I officially crashed in, in my young life. Um, but they would always have an Easter photo op, you know, back in the, in the 70s when we were kids and parents, you know, they dressed you up and they drag you to meet a giant frickin' bunny, you know? <laughs> It's, it's the most, you know, and you guys have gone online and you've seen all those pictures of, you know, all the pictures of kids just screaming bloody murder because mom and dad plopped them down on the lap of a giant freaky bunny, you know. Um, 
That was the inspiration for this scene. We wanted to make you feel like you were going to an Easter Bunny photo op in a mall in the 70s. Because nothing could be scarier than that. And of course that means we needed a giant Easter egg basket. Some guy on our prop crew just made this. I just showed up one day and I went, oh, look at that. You're, you're quite skilled with whatever that, whatever you made that out of, you know. It's, it looks, it might be wood, I'm not even sure. Um, and of course we needed giant Easter eggs, you know. And all sorts of bad things are coming out of these Easter eggs. Um, and, but we wanted that classic tableau, you know, the Easter egg. And these are all, you know, behind the scenes pictures. None of this stuff's finished. I'm just showing it to you because I felt like it. Um, you know, the, the screaming child sitting on the lap of the Easter bunny. And then this is <laughs> this is when they were like just starting to set it up. And I, I walked into I walked into our offsite facility, and I was like, "Oh my God, I love I'm in love. This is great." <laughs> um, do you guys remember last year we did Terror Tram? We did um, Hollywood Harry. Yeah. Do you remember like his secret lair, like his little serial killer lair? That's it. <laughs> we work in a place that looks like a place a serial killer would hang out. You know. That, that was literally where I, you know, I shot it right there. Um, so of course you're gonna, you know, you're gonna go into this nightmarish Easter Bunny, you know, photo op from the 1970s and be attacked by the Easter Bunny. Um, what I did with Figure is work, I wrote like kid songs for like every one, like almost every single one of these holidays. Um, I wrote like a little ditty, um, and I made the terrible mistake of like, I, I, I'm like you know, I, I don't know if most of you guys know, I live in Ireland now. Um, I have the longest commute in the history of this industry, <laughs> you know, 6,000 miles to be here today, um, and then flying tomorrow. Um, but, so I, I write everything there, and then I go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth throughout the year. Um, so I hadn't seen this, and I walked in, and I was like, oh my god. Um, and it gave me this idea, I'm like, I'm going to write, like, songs. I'm going to write, like, little kid songs, creepy little kid songs, and, and have figure, you know, work with me, and we'll do the music that way. Um, so I wrote, like, this little Easter Bunny song, um, and it's all about him taking his bat and, you know, <laughs> hitting the kids on the head, and, and I was singing it, you know, practicing in the house, and then to my great horror and dismay, my four-year-old and my six-year-old daughters were like going around, you know, with this baseball, you know, started singing it, and my wife's just looking at me going, you taught them that song, and I'm like, no, they're just really good at picking up stuff. Fourth of July. <laughs> You know, firework safety. Of course, that's the first thing that comes to mind when you're when you're thinking about doing a, a scary Fourth of July scene. And you know, again, um, that classic roadside firework stand. You know, that's that you find out in the middle of nowhere, maybe in the Midwest or somewhere on Route 66. That's that's the idea here. But you know, they like sell cigarettes and fireworks. It's just a really bad combination. So they set fire to everything. Everything's blowing up. Um, it's very patriotic themed, um, but that meant, you know, I don't know if you realize this, but like, I can't just take a product, you know, like if we're doing a scene with a bunch of fireworks, I just can't take like some fireworks box and put it on the set, you know, everything, everything under the sun these days is copyrighted, right? So that means our graphics team have to design fake products, and they've been doing this for years. Um, these are their fake fireworks brands that don't really exist, like the Mauler. <laughs> But again, I just, I just love the fact that the, these guys are so creative and what's great about getting to work with so many talented people is they bring to, to the event all sorts of creativity that we didn't even think of. Um, I'll show you a couple more. Um, all of the scenes in this maze are kind of set up by these postcards or these graphics. So that's our Halloween one and uh, one of my personal favorites, Thanksgiving. My, my favorite character in the whole event last year was Turkey Lurkey. If you, <laughs> that evil turkey dressed in a pilgrim costume. I just thought that was awesome. Um, so what we did for his scene is it's kind of like that Norman Rockwell Thanksgiving painting, you know, that classic painting of the family all gathered, and there's mom and dad and grandma and, you know, Aunt Susie and etc. And, um, there's grandma. <laughs> Cause grandma's dead, Aunt Susie lost her head. Um, and it's true, they did. Um, this is the prop guys, this is what they call, we call roughing it out. So they're just setting bodies down, none of this is finished, and then Chris or myself comes through, mostly Chris, 
being the art director, and then he kind of goes, okay, yeah, good with that, good with that, no, I don't like that body, get rid of that one, swap it out. Um, but my idea is that the turkeys would take their revenge, as they surely have every right to do, you know, we've been eating them for millennium, um, and they would kill everybody having dinner, but they would kill them with the implements of that dinner and with anything they found on the table. So, you know, they stab people to death, of course, with carving knives and forks and that type of thing. But I don't know if you noticed, but Grandma's throat has been slashed with a wishbone, you know, stuck in her throat. Um, I wanted one guy, like, you know, drowned in, in a jello mold. <laughs> so our prop guys actually, like, made jello, which is pretty amazing. Um, and it's just all the crazy stuff these guys have to create. Um, all right. So that's a little bit on maze graphics and art. Fallen Angels is, well, it's hard to describe. I'm just going to show it to you. Um, it's these skeletal guys that are bejeweled. You know, there's all these jewels all over them. So they're like these ornamented skulls. And they all have these kind of like, almost like biker jacket, angel tattoo, you know, wings embroidered on the back of their costume. Um, but each one of them is different, and there's, I'm only showing you a couple of them. There's a whole bunch of these guys. Of course, they're all armed with chainsaws. Um, and just to give you an example of the amount of work that has to go into what our makeup artists are doing right now, um, is like, after you sculpt the skull and you make the skull, they have to you know, apply all of these jewels to every one of them. I just brought one. That's just one, and there's a whole bunch of them. So it's just a kind of a totally different look than anything we've done before. Um, probably the zone, one of the ones I'm most excited for is called Spirits and Demons of the East. Um, we've talked about this for years and a lot of times people on Twitter you know, you know, make suggestions and they say like, you should do something with, um, with you know, Asian myths or ghosts or demons. Um, and we've thought about it, we've just never done it before. Um, so this year we decided this is going to be the year we actually do this because there's a wealth of amazing characters, uh, in incredible creatures and designs, and we wanted to bring all that to life. So this is kind of the big hub part of the upper deck of the theme park. We call it our New York set area. It's right in front of Universal Plaza. Um, and I'll just sh you know, show you some of the character designs. These are very costume heavy. <laughs> so, you know, we have all these costume designers that have to build every single costume that we think of. Um, and they have to, you know, go by the art and figure out the pattern and figure out, you know, how they're gonna make it. Um, this is just our Chinese and Mongolian ghost characters. Um, I thought it'd be interesting just to show you, this is like the costumes in progress. So these, uh, this, the different costumes they're making for this zone. Um, I love this guy, the samurai demon. Um, so this is what his makeup sculpt looks like. So all of this is really heavily stylized, you know, it's all trying to be authentic to the look of these characters. Um, another one I, I like very much is the dragon demon character. So then we gave this to uh, Pat McGee and his talented team of makeup artists, and then, you know, one night at midnight or something my phone lights up and I get this. So these are pretty amazing. They're all kind of like works of art. <laughs> Here's another thing we've always wanted to do. Always wanted to do this. We've been talking about this for years. We have a lot of stilt walkers that work on our event, and they're, you know, I love stilt walkers. I, if you put me on those things, I would be dead in five minutes. You know, there's no way I could do what they do. They do pirouettes in the street, they jump, um, and every year I just keep adding more and more, because I just love the impact that they have in the event. For years, our stilt walker captain has been coming up to me, and, and uh, Scott Kleckner, who's in charge of training all of our characters with me. Scott Kleckner! Wow! Scott has his fan club here today. And Scott, every year Scott's like, let's do four-legged stills. And we just have never done it before. And this is the year we're doing it. And I haven't told anybody this, so this is all new information. Um, this is a special character we designed for four-legged stilts. So we, we put them on some of our really, really good stilt guys. And they sent me a video, and I think I was in Ireland at the time, and I got this video and I watched it, and I'm like, we must have this. <laughs> so, um, this is his sculpt. 
He's actually looking out the mouth. That's how his vision is. Um, and this is what Pat and his team is doing right now. And then Holidays in Hell actually ends in a scare zone. It's in the upper deck of our theme park. It's a part of our lot we call uh, French Street. Um, and if you, did you guys go to Universal Monsters last year? So we, you know, we had that scare zone that was Monster Masquerade that ended the maze. And I just loved the fact that the maze went right into the scare zone. So we created a new scare zone this year that's called Christmas in Hell. And um, the maze ends with Christmas. Christmas is the last thing um, that you see in the maze, and then it bleeds over into the scare zone. So the whole scare zone is Christmas themed. That meant uh, that we got to invent new characters like Satan Claus. I didn't realize this, you know. Um, if you just rearrange the letters Santa, it spells Satan. It spells Satan. So this is uh, this is Satan Claus. So then again, we give it to Pat McGee and his team, and that's what you get back. So uh, the Christmas part of the maze is actually like a Christmas tree lot. It just happens to be Satan Claus's Christmas tree lot, and you we we kind of theme the whole exit of the maze so it kind of blends organically into French Street, and then it picks up. Um, you know, it allows us to bring back some characters that we've done in the past from like Dark Christmas. Do you guys remember Dark Christmas? Yeah, it was a scare zone we did years ago. It was the first Christmas themed scare zone we did. So some of those evil elf characters, Jack Frost, which is a character, although he's getting a whole new look this year. Um, you know, Mrs. Claus, which we had in Holidays in Hell last year. Um, but also, you know, at the very end of the scare zone, you run into Baby New Year 1929. <laughs> this is what he looks like. Um, and this is his sculpt in process. Um, and I mentioned, you know, I love still walkers. So I wanted to do a nutcracker. I just thought that would be so cool, you know? Just a big, evil nutcracker with big, you know, big giant teeth. Um, so this is the sculpt. Oh, sorry. Here, here's his costume. So again, the costume department, you know, Lucas does a drawing, gives a rendering, and then we give that to our costume department, and then they have to build everything, and that's just the costume in process, and then this is the sculpt. Yeah. Should be fun. I think we should just leave them in the park for Christmas after Halloween. You know, we actually did that, do you guys remember, do you remember, we actually did that one, like, way back, like, I know I've been there like way too long, but like, you know, um, it might have been like 2006 or right when we were kind of bringing Horror Nights back. Um, we actually did like a scary Christmas zone during regular Christmas. We only did it once <laughs> and never did it again after that. It was kind of cool. Bring it back. Bring it back. Wow. Well, there you, you've heard it, so I guess you guys, you, know, you can write letters. <laughs> uh, another, you know, we're, we're doing Toxic Tunnel with three X's this time. You know it's new because it has three X's. Not two, like last year, it's got three this time. Um, <laughs> and people always ask me things like, you know, why are you doing Toxic Tunnel again? I'm like, well, you guys are walking to the back lot, and you're walking through a tunnel. And you know, it's a tunnel. <laughs> I can't change it, it's a tunnel. Um, what that actually is, that's, that's, you know, that's back of house movie studio. That's part of the big technical building in the shop where they build all of, you know, um, where, where they maintain and build the sets for movies and TV shows. That's what you guys are actually walking through, that big tunnel. Um, so this year we decided to go a little bit of a different direction with the characters. They've been, you know, different things down through the years. But I really like the design aesthetic of kind of, the, you know, the hot rod monsters you know, kind of Big Daddy Ed Roth, that type of thing. Um, so it, they're kind of like, you know, monster mechanics, if you will. So this is just Frankie and Drac, you know. But it's all done in that kind of crazy, you know, crazy cartoon, you know, hot rod, you know, aesthetic. And that's kind of the, the, the way we're approaching Toxic Tunnel. And then last but not least, um, we always have a big scare zone and every year it kind of gets bigger and bigger down in the Metro Set area, which is the back lot part of, of uh, the movie studio where we build usually three mazes. Um, okay. 
when I'm jet lagged, I always have to, to check myself. Um, what mazes have we announced? Let's make sure I don't <laughs> screw this up. That's where Frankenstein meets the Wolfman is gonna be out there. Um, that's where Ghostbusters, you heard about that, I assume, yeah, Ghostbusters. That's where Ghostbusters can be. And by the way, I, oh, it's good, I can actually tell you all three. Um, that's where Creepshow's gonna be. So Creepshow is on the opposite side of that giant wall um, that last year would have been like the Horrors of Blumhouse or, you know, a couple of years before that, American Horror Story. That's where Creepshow's gonna be. Um, but there, you know, the first thing that happens when you walk across the street and you, after you've gone through Toxic Tunnel is you get to uh, the Metro Set area. We always started with a scare zone. Last year it was Holidays in Hell. Um, and this year uh, we created a scare zone that is now called All, All Hollows Evil. Um, it, I say now called because uh, a guy who works really closely with me and Chris and has for years and years and years on Horror Nights and his specialty is always park decor and the scare zones. He's the guy who actually uh, is, deserves all of the credit for the scare zones. His name is Pat Quinn. He's probably here somewhere tonight. Um, I don't know if he wants to stand up or not. I can embarrass him. Pat, are you in the audience? Patty! Where are you? Somebody point to Pat. All right, there he is. There he is. Give it up for Pat Quinn. Uh, Chris and I have known Pat, you know, for, for years and years and years, and Pat just thinks differently than Chris and I, you know, and he, and he, his brain works in, in ways I can't describe, but in really good ways. Um, but he always has really cool ideas for scare zones and characters and, and things we wouldn't normally have thought of. He's the one who brought, you know, the, uh, the idea of doing spirits and demons of the Far East. You know, that was, you know, for, that was Pat's idea. All of these scare zones are his idea. And then he comes and he pitches them to Chris and I. And the vast majority of the time, we just go, that's great, let's do it. Um, so he pitched me a scare zone that he originally titled Sam Hain Festival of Darkness. But I'm Irish now. That's not how you pronounce that word. <laughs> it, I don't know if you know, uh, Halloween actually originated in, in Ireland, you know, and it was a harvest festival that Americans call Samhain. And, and I'm gonna mess this up entirely and every person in Ireland's gonna beat me up the minute I got off the plane Monday morning when I fly tomorrow night. Um, but I think it's pronounced Saum. Saum, right? Saum. So I just couldn't do a scare zone called Saum. Festival of Darkness. So, Festival of Darkness. So, uh, we changed the name to All Hallows Evil, but the idea that Pat came up is the same. It's to, to pay homage to all of that great pagan, you know, original, original Halloween, pagan festival, harvest festival. I'll show you a few characters. The pagan witch, uh, and the druid. Uh, and we're weaving in different things. It's not exclusively Irish, you know, it's kind of all of that kind of early mythological stuff. Uh, Wendigo Scarecrow, uh, we call him Murder of Crows. <laughs> and then this, this is one Pat really had to sell us on. <laughs> He's like, I want to do a green man. And we were like, what? Um, but when they drew it up, he and you know, working with Lucas drew it up, we were like, oh my God, that's so cool. And I just got this last night and banged it into this deck so I could share it with you. So this is the sculpt in process for the green man. And he gets these big, big, huge horns on his head. And then last but not least, uh, again, still walkers. I love still walkers. Pat designed a really cool Wendigo still walking character. It's like eight foot tall. And that's the sculpted process. And that's his incredibly large horns on the top of his head. All right. And that's what I have to share with you today for Halloween Horror Nights 2019. All right. I just got the five minute warning, which means my God, I'm on time. I, have, I never think about, when I put these things together, I just go, eh, 120 pages, fine. I never even try to like time it. And it